Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal of the Continuing Church of God, and welcome to the first day of Unleavened Bread. This particular holy day is one that was implemented by God thousands and thousands of years ago out in the Old Testament during the time just before the Exodus, actually, or the beginning of the Exodus, if you will. Many Christians have not heard of it, but it's actually something that Christians have kept uh, from the time of Christ till present. Let's look at its foundations, its relationship to sin, and what relationship it has to Christians in the 21st century, and what you should think about it. So if you've got your Bibles, let's go to the book of Exodus, chapter 12. Because in Exodus, chapter 12, you read about the uh, Passover, which most people are familiar with. But then, if you go down to verse 15, you start to hear about the days of, of unleavened bread. And a lot of people who profess Christ really aren't familiar with those. Of course, those of us in the Church of God have been keeping the days of love and bread since the time of Christ. But even those of us who have been keeping it for most of our lives, all of our lives, or maybe even if this is your first days of love and bread, there's still things that we can learn from it and through it. So starting with verse 15, it says, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. So notice it's seven days you're supposed to do something, eat unleavened bread. What's unleavened bread? Unleavened bread is bread that does not have yeast in it, or baking soda. What does yeast and baking soda do? Or, uh, basically what they do is help puff up the bread, so it's not as hard. So it makes it a little easier to eat, and for some people they think it tastes better, and uh, for some things it is better. But you're supposed to eat unleavened bread. So that would be bread made without yeast, or leavening agents. Now that's not that hard to do. You can actually take... Uh, a, flour and water and mix it together and bake it and you're going to get unleavened bread. You can get fancier and add eggs and some other things to it to get unleavened bread. Now I will comment for those of you, especially if this is your first time to be exposed to Days of Unleavened Bread, you do not have to get something that's been blessed by a rabbi and eat that during the Days of Unleavened Bread. It doesn't say that. The Bible simply says for seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And there's a variety of types of unleavened bread out there. And there are recipes sometimes uh, on the internet. Uh, you can find some in cookbooks. But there's a whole many different types of unleavened bread. But notice you're supposed to do this for seven days. Now, seven days biblically tends to be a time of uh, completion. You recall that in six days uh, God made the heaven and earth and seen all that in them is, and on the seventh day He rested. So the, the first week uh, was a period of completion, the physical creation and the spiritual creation. And the time of the seven days of leavened bread to give us seven days to become more complete, to try to live a more sinless, sinless life. So notice it says, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. First day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. So how this actually worked is all leaven had to be removed before uh, sunset on the 15th of the Hebrew calendar of the month known as uh, uh, Abib or Nisan. So it would be removed uh, just prior to that. Uh, and uh, it says, and on the first day there should be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day there should be a holy convocation for you. A holy convocation means a church service. Now many of you uh, in the Continuing Church of God or those of you who are interested in Church of God teachings are in areas where we do not have local congregations. So how we have a holy convocation, if you will, is, or get, get together, is by you keeping these days, doing what the Bible says, but actually watching these type of messages on the, the holy days. And that way we have a holy convocation. And if you're in an area where we have uh, ministers or deacons or hosts or whatever, and you get together, uh, that's fantastic. But for those of you who are more scattered and separated, uh, once a week, we usually put out a letter to the brethren with suggested services, etc., and which is what would have happened for this time. Anyway, it says on the first day, no manner of work shall be done on them, if it's the first and last day, but that which is necessary that you must eat. Verse 17, so you shall observe the Feast of Eleven Bread. On the same day, I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generation as an everlasting ordinance. And if First month, the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. So, so at the end of the 14th at sunset through the 
and to the 21st at sunset, you're supposed to eat unleavened bread during those days. Now, you're allowed to eat other things. It's just you also need to eat some unleavened bread. Now, notice verse 19. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses. And since no leaven is supposed to be found in your houses, all the leaven needs to be removed prior to sunset, the end of the 14th. Since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native in the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwellings you shall eat unleavened bread. So this is pretty specific. It tells people what they should do. Uh, many of you may say, well, that's in the Old Testament. And we'll get to the New Testament application in, in a while. So until then, please bear with me as I go through more scriptures in the Old Testament about the days of oven bread. So if you're already in Exodus, take your Bibles. And let's go to ver chapter 23. Exodus 23. Here's some more about these particular, this particular time. Starting verse 14, it says, Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. Verse 15, You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you. So notice this is uh, something God has commanded. At the time appointed in the month of Abib, for you came out of Egypt, none of him shall be appear before me empty. And then it talks about some other uh, times that you were supposed to keep. Then dropping down to verse 18, You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread. So God has some particular rules about sacrifices. Now some of you again may be thinking, if, especially if you don't have a Church of God background, well, wasn't Jesus Christ at the Passover land sacrificed for us? Yes. And that happens the night before the day of the leavened bread. But while Jesus takes away the sins of the world, his, his sacrifice and our acceptance of Jesus' sacrifice, once the sin is taken away, are we supposed to continue in sin? Are we supposed to sin? Well, the answer is no. And that's actually one of the things that the Days of Unleavened Bread picture. It pictures uh, having come out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage, the house of spiritual bondage, to use a spiritual analogy here, but also that once we've accepted Christ's sacrifice, and we can say if you keep the Passover as well, and uh, you're cleansed from your sins, you should be diligent to not have any sin in your life. Just like there's supposed to be no leaven found in your houses during the seven days, you should try to be diligent, actually more diligent, to try not to have any sin found in your spiritual house, your body, and your mind. Let's go over to uh, Exodus chapter 34 this time. And this time we're going to pick it up oh, somewhere around verse 18. So let's go there. Exodus 34, verse 18. The feast of unleavened bread you shall keep. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you in the appointed time of the month of Abib. Again, that's the first month of the Hebrew calendar. Most years it starts in March or April. and Every year it starts in March or April. Uh, for the month of Abib you came out of Egypt. So again, you'll notice that seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Now there are some people who believe that you don't have to eat unleavened bread during the seven days of leavened bread, um, unless that's not possible for some uh, some unusual reason. Uh, I strongly recommend or advise that you will consume a, at least a small amount of unleavened bread every day. Now, let's say you're gluten intolerant or something, so you're worried about wheat. You can make unleavened bread from uh, rice, uh, corn. Uh, there's lots of types of unleavened bread, uh, for example. Uh, most corn tortillas are unleavened bread. Okay, it's a type of bread and there's no leaven in it. By eating a small amount of unleavened bread every day during the days of unleavened bread, it helps remind us that these are the days of unleavened bread. It helps remind us that we're supposed to be unleavened spiritually. It reminds us that we don't want to have sin in our life. It should remind us to be more careful to look at whatever sins may be in our lives and try to... Uh, be completely purged of sin. So, in the Old Testament, where God says, look, you, there should be no leaven found in your houses during these seven days. In the New Testament, we get the impression that no leaven of sin is supposed to be found in our lives. Ever, of course. But, but of course, as it, the Apostle John wrote, uh, if you say we have not sinned, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. So, it's not that we never sin, 
but we're supposed to strive for perfection, as Jesus Christ said. And one way to do this is once a year to examine ourselves before we take Passover, and then after we've taken Passover, not to just go back to totally a normal life, but for the next seven days, eat unleavened bread as a reminder that Christ paid the penalty for our sins and that we should not have sin in our life. And by eating a small amount of unleavened bread, it's a physical reminder. It makes you think. Uh, I've had some people say, well, everything is spiritual, and they spiritualize all the Old Testament. Well, there are parts that are certainly have spiritual applications, including the days of unleavened bread. But as physical human beings, actually consuming unleavened bread uh, daily reminds us that we are uh, we're in the flesh, reminds us that we're supposed to look into our lives to purge out sin. Now I'd like to uh, to go to Leviticus chapter 23. For those of you who have a Church of God background, you're probably familiar with this, but since this is the first of the Holy Convocation required holy days, or commanded holy days uh, of the year, because God's year, sacred year begins in the spring, I thought we'd start with verse 1 of Leviticus 23. And the eternal, or Yahweh, or as it says here, Lord, spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, The feasts of the eternal, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. So these are God's feasts. And in verse 3, it talks about the Sabbath. Six days shall work be done, the seventh day is the Sabbath. Of solemn rest, of holy convocation, you shall no, do no work on it. For it's the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. So again, the idea, you've got six days where you work, what's the Sabbath? Make seven days, it makes a complete week. So there's a type of completion in the seven days. And cutting down to verse 4, it says, These are the feasts of the eternal holy convocation, which you shall proclaim to appointed times. The 14th day, the first month at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Love and Bread. So after sunset on the 14th, so that evening after the 14th is over, is the Feast of Love and Bread, the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Now this is a translation from this, in this particular case, the New King James Version from Protestant uh, scholars, and they're saying that Hebrew says you must eat unleavened bread. And we in the Continuing Church of God uh, tell you that that's what you're supposed to do, unless there's some reason you can't do it. If you're trying to obey God, you will eat at least a small amount of unleavened bread every single day of those seven days during the days of unleavened bread. Verse 7, On the first day you shall have a holy convocation, you shall do no customary work on it. And so, in this particular uh, day, we do basically like we keep the Sabbath. We do not uh, do work on this particular day. We don't go to our normal jobs. Uh, our children do not go to attend school on this particular day. Uh, again, this is a holy uh, convocation, so we keep it holy by not working. We keep, ho keep it holy by eating unleavened bread. We keep it holy by uh, uh, prayer. We keep it holy by participating in services. And for many of you, or for those of you who are watching this, obviously, uh, you may be in a local congregation that actually plays this, or you may be at your house with yourself, or maybe with your spouse, or maybe with some other people. But again, we're supposed to keep this particular day holy. Now, let's go over to uh, Ezekiel chapter 45, verse 21. Ezekiel 45, verse 21. This day is talked about, or this time is talked about there as well. Ezekiel 45, verse 21. In the first month, and the fourteenth day of the month, you shall serve the Passover, a feast of seven days, unleavened bread shall be eaten. I had you go over to Ezekiel just to show that this was not the commands of the of this particular day. We're not just limited to the first five books of the Old Testament, which a lot of people would tend to think. Now, something a point I'd like to bring up. Let's go to Second Chronicles chapter eight, verse thirteen. Second Chronicles uh, before Esther and all those kind of books. Second Chronicles eight, verse thirteen. Now, 
Now it talks about Solomon. We're going to start at verse 12. This is, uh, this is 2 Chronicles chapter 8, starting verse 12. It says, Then Solomon offered burnt offerings to the Eternal, on the altar of the Eternal, which he had built before the vestibule. Verse 13. According to the daily rate, according offering according to the commandments of Moses for the Sabbath, the new moons, and the three appointed yearly festivals. Notice these are called yearly festivals. This is something that's supposed to be done once per year. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. I wanted to point this out because some people seem to believe that they should have some version of Passover either every day or every week. Uh, the Passover, which was tied in with the Days of Love and Bread, was once a year. The Days of Love and Bread are once a year. Uh, while, if you want, you never have to eat leaven. The Bible actually never commands that you need to eat leaven. Uh, it's not necessary to keep more than uh, a portion of Passover plus the seven days of unleavened bread uh, with, to, to, eat, to eat unleavened bread. Beyond that, you don't have to eat it. And as far as leaven or unleavened bread, to other days of the year, you don't have to eat leavened bread, you don't have to eat unleavened bread. But again, notice this is a, an annual one. Now, I remember talking to somebody years ago and they for some reason didn't seem to like the days of unleavened bread. I don't know, maybe they could go, go without cakes or breads or pizza or whatever it was that they wanted. I really don't remember anymore. But in our family, we've always tended to enjoy the days of unleavened bread. Um, it seems to put my wife more in a baking mood. Uh, so every year she finds all kinds of recipes and works on them to, uh, to make something interesting. But how does God want us to view the days of leavened bread? Is some horrible burden? Is it really that bad to go without leavened bread for sandwiches for, for a week? I don't think so, but let's go over, to, since we're in Second Chronicles, let's go to uh, chapter 30, starting verse 21. So Second Chronicles 30, starting verse 21. So the children of Israel who were present at Jerusalem kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days and they were horrified and so sad that they couldn't have donuts or whatever it is. No, it says they kept it with great gladness. And then the Levites and the priests praised the Eternal day by day, singing to the Lord, accompanied by loud instruments. So we see here they kept it. Now go down to verse 23. They enjoyed keeping the Days of Unleavened Bread so much, in verse 23, that the whole assembly agreed to keep the feast another seven days. They kept it another seven days with gladness. So we see that it's a good thing. It's something that should be done with gladness. You should be happy that you keep the Days of Unleavened Bread as opposed to, all right, when is sunset the 21st? Oh, I just can't stand not having bread. By the way, it's fine to go out and have bread after sunset on the 21st. But again, I've never considered the Days of Leaven Bread to be a burden in terms of uh, not being able to eat leaven. Uh, of course, during the Days of Leaven Bread, you have to watch yourself. If you have habits to go into certain restaurants or shops, uh, you need to be careful you don't start to consume unleavened bread uh, by accident. Uh, many people have done so uh, to their uh, chagrin. But even that, you have to think about it, remind you that, you know what, in your life, there's sin that you don't really think about. You actually have habits that you don't recognize, and maybe you do recognize, but you don't totally overcome these sins. Now, the Bible says that we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. And I know that some of you are going through very severe trials, uh, physical trials, uh, financial trials, relationship trials right now. And it doesn't seem like, it just doesn't seem like uh, they can be overcome. But again, the Bible also says that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. And we can do all things through Christ Jesus. The problem is, people tend to give up. But the Bible also says, he or she, who endures the end, the same will be saved. So if you're struggling with various problems right now, and I should say, who isn't? Be patient. Continue. Now let's go to the book of Ezra which comes after Chronicles. Uh, and I went too far when I was going over this. It's going to be Ezra chapter 6. I'm going to go to verse 22, I think. Well, 
Let's start in verse 21. The children of Israel returned from the captivity. They ate together with all those who separated themselves from the filth of the nations of the land in order to seek the eternal God of Israel. So notice that they had to return and they wanted to be away from the filth of the world. Now, I'm not saying that actual leaven is actual filth of the world. But leaven picture, helps picture sin and that, that how pervasive sin is in, in our society. So you notice the children of Israel, they separated themselves from the filth of the world, they called it. And so what did they then do? Verse 22. And they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. And the eternal made them joyful and turned the heart of the kings of Assyria toward them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. So because they kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread with joy, God gave them favor in the sight of the king of Assyria at this time. And God wanted their hearts to be joyful during the days of Unleavened Bread. And that's how your attitude should be. Now the days of Unleavened Bread, since this is the sermon is intended for the first day of Unleavened Bread, if you're watching it on that particular day, that means you have the rest of this day and six more days. Do this joyfully. And as I say, to add physical joy to it, uh, uh, my wife has traditionally made unusual things or baked unusual things. Um, some come out better than others, but they're usually they're all fine. <laughs> okay, I should say that. But it's always interesting, and it makes it uh, physically a bit joyful because you never know what we're going to have. And from a physical perspective, I do not miss having lemon, which is a, sort of unusual because my typical lunch would be two pieces of leavened bread with uh, avocado and some organic mayonnaise. That's kind of my typical lunch. So I'm used to having leaven uh, five days a week for my lunch. Now, some days I don't have it, but so it is something that, that I'm used to. But I don't miss not having it. Matter of fact, it's kind of neat to break the routine and do something different. And I, by the way, I don't always have sandwiches for lunch. It's just frequently what so it seems like I do. And if I do have a sandwich, sometimes it's different than that. So we see that we've got this in the Old Testament. God commanded it. He said there should be no leaven found in your house. This is, you're supposed to keep these feasts for seven days. You're supposed to eat unleavened bread for seven days. But what about the New Testament? Let's go to the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians, we're going to go to chapter 5. So 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 6. Here we find that uh, the Apostle Paul was dealing with some people. And you can read about them in the earlier part of verse of chapter 5. It's talking about that there was somebody who was committing uh, sexual immorality with his father's wife. And Paul is saying, you guys should not have tolerated this. But instead, they're acting like they have great tolerance. You know, right now, as we see... Uh, the homosexual agenda go forward. We see increased uh, public and celebrity pornography going forward. The world in general wants us to be tolerant, accepting of this type of thing. Um, we don't have to be accepting. Now, that doesn't mean we should go uh, yell down people's throats or that kind of thing or condemn them uh, in that way uh, when it's not appropriate. But in this particular congregation, these are Church of God people. These are true Christians. And they're tolerating sexual immorality. They think, oh, it's okay. He can do it because it's his life. It's not us. But they don't realize that they're being affected by it. The congregation's uh, acceptance of public outright sin hurts the congregation. It hurts the people. It hurts their own development. And will tend to lead to, to personal compromise and more sin on their part. So you go down to verse 6. The Apostle Paul says to him, Your glory is not good. Do you... Not know that a, le a little leaven levels, leavens the whole lump. If you've ever made bread and you've got uh, the flour, the water, whatever else you might put into it. And by the way, I guess I should comment. Some people wonder if you can have salt during the days of bread. And normally the answer is yes, even though the, uh, the Jews have their own rules about that. Although I would not use, I would avoid salt that had baking soda in it. But uh, otherwise, yes, it's okay. The, the Jews sometimes have added additional rules for their observations, their diet, and that type of a thing. They're not in the scripture. Matter of fact, when Jesus was on the earth, 
he actually uh, condemned them for a variety of extra rules that they added. So again, I mention that because some of these things will sound Jewish to some of you. And you'll think, ah, well, the Jews must know how to do it right. And they should know how to do it right, but uh, they, throughout history, added a bunch of restrictions and other things that are not coming from the Bible. Anyway, the Apostle Paul in verse 7 says, Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. And in Old Testament times, they did that by, in a sense, they were by removing the physical leaven. In New Testament times, we also remove the physical leaven, but we're also supposed to be concentrating on what leaven represents and to be considering how sin and society affects us. Anyway, it says, Purge out the, the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened. When are you unleavened? Notice this. Verse continuing. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. So he's tying in Passover with the days of unleavened bread, which is what we see in the Old Testament. It also tied Passover in with the unleavened days of unleavened bread. Verse 8 is interesting. It says, Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor the leaven of malice and wickedness, but of the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So see here, we see that leaven is tied in with malice and wickedness from a spiritual analogy perspective. But unleavened bread is associated with sincerity and truth. Now many who profess Christianity uh, do not keep the days of unleavened bread. They keep a lot of days the Bible does not say to keep. But notice it says you're supposed to keep this with sincerity and truth. Well, truthfully, Jesus kept the Passover days of unleavened bread. His apostles kept Passover days of unleavened bread. After he died, the apostles kept Passover days of unleavened bread. Church history shows throughout history, Christians kept Passover the days of unleavened bread. Instead, we see substitutes these days. We see people essentially uh, who had broken away from the Church of God or claimed to be part of the Church of God or had distant connections to the Church of God instead had their own fasts, if you will, or abstinence times for like a week or so around the same time. But they decided they weren't going to abstain from uh, unleavened bread and they came up with various restrictions or decide what you want to give up. And while some people might say, well, that's better if we decide what we should give up, notice that the Apostle Paul says, leaven pictures malice and wickedness, and unleavened bread pictures sincerity and truth. He doesn't say, pick what you want to give up or, or not give up, because everything is the same as far as God's con concerned. And the reality is, therefore, that is not truth. And those of us who keep the days of unleavened bread hopefully have put a much greater higher priority on truth. Because the truth is, this is a biblically commanded holy day that teaches a lot of spiritual lessons. In Romans 3, verse 25, you don't have to go there, I'll just read it. It states that in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. So in the Old Testament, there was the observance of Passover, most of you, if not all of you, know this story. The death angel passed over the children of Israel who had the blood on their doorposts and he, uh, forget, he did not have the children of Israel, the firstborn of the children of Israel, struck down. Those of us who are Christians, we don't have to physically put the blood on our doorpost, but we accept the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, who is our Passover sacrifice for us, which the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, which I read a moment ago. But notice that the spiritual application, in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. So, New Testament Christians were still keeping Passover. They weren't keeping it because the, uh, for a memorial, per se, of the death angel passing over the children of Israel. That was actually what's called an antitype, a physical precessor to try to explain to people what it was going to be like when Jesus Christ was going to come. And then Jesus died for us because of that. Uh, God has passed over our sins. And that's, by the way, where the word pass, Passover becomes the word pass and over. Now, if God's uh, passed over our sins, does that mean we're supposed to continue to sin? Of course not. 
Just a few verses later, in Romans 3, verse 31, the Apostle Paul wrote, On the contrary, we establish the law. So we're not supposed to continue in sin once our sins have been passed over. Various ones of various Greco-Roman faiths think, well, it doesn't really matter that we sin. We don't have to worry about it because Jesus will forgive us of our sins. Yes, if you properly uh, repent, Jesus will uh, for, accept Jesus' sacrifice. Sorry, Jesus will you, you forgive your sins, but you're not supposed to remain in them and go out and try to sin, so Jesus will have to forgive you more or some nonsense like that. That actually is warned about in the book of Jude. Now let's also go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. So just a few verses over here, a few pages over here, excuse me. Now I'll start in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, we give him thanks, he broke it, said, take this, this is my body, which is broken, take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner did the cup. It's the cup of the new covenant uh, in my blood. This do often as you do, as you drink it, which is once a year in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, we've talked about this before. But it goes in verse 27. You're not supposed to eat this bread or drink this cup in an unworthy manner. You're supposed to examine yourselves. But brethren... If you take Passover, the prior evening of the uh, uh, after sunset on the 13th, which is the 14th of uh, the month of Nisan, once you've done that, you're not supposed to continue in sin, and you should try to continue to examine yourselves. Oh, and by the way, if you're watching this video and you have no idea when these holy days are, or even if you think you have an idea and you want to know when they actually are, if you go to the www.cogwriter.com website, that C-O-G-W-R-I-T-E-R.com website, there's a holiday calendar through, I think the year 2027 has the holy days, all the holy days. And we actually have a calendar in uh, several other languages. I know there's one in Mandarin Chinese, uh, there's one in uh, Spanish, and there may be some other uh, languages. There's a few others that we're trying to, to put up there, so we'll have... Uh, more there. Of course, if you're watching this and can understand what I'm saying, uh, most likely you'll be able to read the English uh, version. But we are uh, reaching people in uh, hundreds of countries around the world, and therefore uh, we try to provide information in multiple languages whenever we can to help them. Now, even though Christians would read the passage in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the ones that I was just reading a few moments ago, they seem like they brush over it. Why? I think it's because they don't tend to keep the days of leavened bread. If they kept the days of leavened bread, it would kind of make them stop and pause and consider, wait a second, you know, what sins do I still need to overcome? As opposed to, I've been washed with the blood of the Lamb, I'm all fine, and this is fine. I don't really need to build righteous character. I don't need to strive for perfection, even though Jesus said to do that. But if they stopped and actually physically kept the days of unleavened bread, it may be that this would make an impression on them. And it should make an impression on you as well. Remember I read before that this is a yearly uh, observance, once a year. And of course I also read one time a group of people decided to do it uh, twice in a year, but that's pretty untypical. And you're not necessarily more righteous if, by the way, you go around and keep it another seven days. Uh, I've never kept it a second seven days. Although, uh, in a sense, I have sort of by accident. I know I've been in places where uh, I was not able to get bread, so maybe I've kept 10, 12 days and 11 bread. I don't know the exact number. I don't know if I've really got 14 days in a row. But it wasn't really intentional on my part. But on the other hand, I really don't miss it when I don't have bread. I don't miss leaven. I don't tend to eat cakes uh, or, or cookies. And you can actually get cookies without leaven. They're just as easy to make without leaven. So uh, I don't really miss uh, having 11 in my life, but typically I'll keep the days of bread. So I'll go seven or eight days, maybe nine, uh, without it, just because when I get, we get around to it or my wife gets to shopping, then we'll have some leaven in the house again. Now in the Bible, as I mentioned before, leaven normally pictures malice, wickedness, or even uh, hypocrisy. 
If you take your uh, your Bibles, uh, let's go to uh, Matthew chapter six, uh, sixteen. I'm sorry, Matthew sixteen, and we're going to start in verse six. Matthew sixteen, verse six, and we're going to hear what uh, what Jesus taught related to eleven. Matthew 16, verse 6. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, at this stage, you think the disciples would know what Jesus is talking about, but no, verse 7. And they reasoned among themselves, It's because we have no bread. Okay. Verse 8. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves that you've brought no bread? Don't you yet understand or remember about the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Of course, Jesus referring then to the miracle where he had five, uh, five loaves of bread and was able to feed 5,000 people. Then and in verse 10, nor the seven loaves of the 4,000 how many large baskets you took up. So again, it's another time there were uh, seven loaves of bread, a few fish. Jesus was able to feed uh, 4,000 people with the 4,000 men, probably maybe even more people in total. And then they collected baskets of leftovers, uh, which was more than the seven loaves of bread and a few fish they start off with. So then Jesus says in verse 11, How is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Verse 12, Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What is their doctrine? Pretense. They tried to, to look like they were faithful religious people to outsiders as opposed to truly living uh, God's way. God's way is not just about a bunch of regulations or outward signs or that type of thing. He said, wait a second, isn't avoiding leaven an outward sign? Yes, but it's an outward sign you're going to do what God says. Plus, it helps instill in us the necessity, the thoughts to go through to examine our lives better, to help uh, purge out sin, which we can do through Jesus Christ. Now, we're in Matthew. I was in Matthew before. Let's go to Matthew 23 now. I saw it from my notes, so I didn't actually turn to Matthew before, so I'll go there right now. Matthew chapter 23. Remember, Jesus was warning about the teachings of the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And this time, verse uh, 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 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Let's go back to verse 25. Now we're going to go further. We're going to verse uh, 24. Blind guides, Jesus says to them, who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Now what's that meaning? Jesus is saying, okay, a gnat's a very small thing, and a camel is a humongous animal uh, compared to a gnat. And back then, you couldn't eat, you weren't supposed to eat a gnat because they're biblically unclean, and we're still not supposed to do that now, or eat a camel, which is biblically unclean. So we see you're not supposed to eat these biblically unclean things. And Jesus says, you're so worried you might get a gnat, which is insignificant, that you're swallowing a whole camel, which means they didn't get it. So this is the problem with their doctrine. Verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside are full of extortion and self-indulgence. And when you keep the days of leavened bread, and you eat your unleavened bread, and you put the leaven out of your life, that's not really uh, something that people on the outside will tend to see. Matter of fact, I rarely, if ever, tell anybody that I work with who's got no church of God background that I don't eat leaven during the days of leavened bread. Um, it's it's more of a personal thing. It's between you and God. Verse 26. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup in addition, and the outside may be cleaned as well. But you might say, wait a second. You Didn't you say that we're supposed to take out the physical leaven first? Yes. But I also had quoted from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that we're supposed to examine ourselves prior to taking the Passover. So we're supposed to work on cleaning the inside prior to taking the Passover. Then, on that day, to finally remove all the leaven from our lives, 
and then keep it out of our lives and eat unleavened bread during the days of unleavened bread as a reminder that we are supposed to be clean on the inside by giving us some outside uh, reminders, if you will. Verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Verse 28, Even so you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. I find that interesting. Jesus condemned the Pharisees for lawlessness. And if you talk to people these days, if you, a lot of them will say, well, if you're keeping the Ten Commandments, uh, you're being like the Pharisees. Uh, no, the Ten Commandments were something that God gave humankind for our benefit. And the Pharisees were into outward show. As a matter of fact, they broke all the Ten Commandments. And I have an article at the cogwriter.com website that so you can read about that. Being pharisaical was not keeping the commandments. Keeping, being pharisaical meant you were hypocritical. You outwardly appeared to be giving, keeping the commandments, but you never understood what they were all about. The Ten Commandments reflect love toward God and love toward neighbor. Our lives are supposed to reflect love toward God and love toward neighbor. The Pharisees didn't get that. The Pharisees thought the law of God was about some rules and how picky can they be on the rules. Whoever kept the rules the best in their view we're doing what was most important. Now, since we're already in Matthew 23, we're going to go back a few more verses again to verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Okay, what's that? Mint's a plant. These others were like spices. And so they would make sure that they gave, if they, let's say they had five leaves of mint. They tear it in half, one of them, because uh, five times two halves is ten. One-tenth would be like a half. And they'd be very picky to make sure that they gave their tithe uh, based on that. And so Jesus said, okay, you did that, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law. Oh, what, what are they? Justice, mercy, and faith. These ought you have done. You should have had justice, mercy, and faith without leaving the other undone. Therefore, you're really supposed to tithe. Then I mentioned this before. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. So Jesus is saying, look, it's, it's fine to not uh, eat the gnat because you're not supposed to. It's fine to tithe. And Jesus actually says, you're supposed to do that. But don't be so picky, focused on the, your precise amount of tithe as you are the way to your matters of the law. Uh, justice, mercy, and faith. The Pharisees never got it. In the churches of God, years ago I wrote an article that uh, there are various types of real Christians these days. I noticed, though, that some tend toward being Pharisaical, uh, a bunch of picky rules that sometimes they don't get, they, they miss the forest for the trees, if you will. They don't understand the part, the love part. They get too focused on some stuff. Then you have, on the other hand, ones you call Sadducees, which think so many things are done away that they get more lax in their lives. We need a proper balance. That's what Jesus was talking about when he said, these you ought to have done without leaving the other undone. In other words, yes, we obey God's laws. Yes, we're supposed to put leaven out of our lives. Yes, we're supposed to live a, a sinful, excuse me, a sinless life as possible. And we should examine ourselves to see how sinful we are. That's what I should have said or at that time. But we're also supposed to understand what it's all about. Justice, mercy, and faith, love. That's what it's all about. The Pharisees never understood that properly. I alluded to this before, but let's go to the book of Jude, chapter... Actually, there's only one chapter. Chapter 1. Uh, Jude. Uh, and I'm going to start, I think, probably around the first verse. I usually don't do that. I usually cut in somewhere else. But I'd like, I think I'd like to start there. Uh, Jude. Book of Jude. Verse 1. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who are called, 
Okay, are you called by God? Are you, if you are, you should pay attention. Sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. So if you're called, sanctified, uh, and preserved in Jesus Christ, you should be a real Christian. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So right there, mercy, which we heard was one of the weightier matters of law, uh, uh, peace and love, and as I've said repeatedly, what this book is really about, what God's plan really has to do with, is love. And you say, well, what's love got to do with not eating bread? A couple of things. One, you're demonstrating that you love God more than you love some physical substance that God asked you to remove. So that's one. Secondly, you're loving your neighbor as yourself by doing this. How, you might ask, how could I possibly be loving my neighbor as myself? My neighbor doesn't care if I eat bread or not. As a matter of fact, he or she probably would prefer I have pizza with them or bread or whatever. So how is it loving my neighbor to not do that and to eat unleavened bread? Well, how it's helping or loving your neighbor is, if, is by not eating leaven. One, you set an example, if your neighbor actually knows. But uh, secondly, by eating unleavened bread, you have to think about examining yourselves and leading a better life. And if you lead a better life, that will show love toward your neighbor. So the days of love and bread all tie into love. Loving God because you're doing what He says. Loving your neighbor because by doing what God says, there are benefits to living God's way of life and doing what God wants you to do. Jude, verse 3 said, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. The, the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, if you have a Church of God background, you realize that the faith once for all delivered to the saints included keeping the days of eleven bread. But if you don't have a Church of God background, you might not think that at all. You might think, well, those were done away. That was nailed at the cross, uh, as, as they call it. But that's simply not the case. If you go through the records of church history, you'll find that early Christians, such as, for example, Polycarp of Smyrna, who was ordained or appointed a bishop by uh, the apostle uh, Paul and perhaps others, he kept the days of love and bread. And various uh, pastors or bishops, depending on which term you prefer to use, uh, were recorded throughout history of keeping these particular days. Faithful ones were shown to keep these particular days. Church of God leaders were shown to keep these days. And the Apostle Paul, uh, not only kept the days, he told people they're supposed to go out and do that. You say, if, if you don't have a, a Church of God background, this may be, it might be puzzling to you. But if you do have a Church of God background, you might say, yeah, well, this is in the Bible. True Christians kept it. Why did other people quit keeping it? Let's go over here in verse 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed. So you go through the Bible. Jesus tells a parable about the uh, the tares being sown in with the wheat. And at first, when they come up, wheat and tares may look the same, depending on what kind of tear or weed uh, is in there. Similarly, we see here that certain men have crept in unnoticed. So they're mixed within the Church of God or the, the Christian faith who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. These are ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you'll say, well, wait a second. The Greco-Roman faith, they don't deny uh, our only Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, they don't deny that He existed. And they claim that they are part of His faith but they're not. They deny our Lord by not obeying Him, doing what the Apostle Paul said, to imitate Him as He imitated Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul kept the days of love and bread. Jesus Christ kept the days of love and bread. Uh, this is one way people deny Christ, by not living as Christ said, or learning the lessons that Christ wants us to learn. Now you say, well, I understand about the Bible and I've been, uh, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my uh, Savior and therefore I should be fine. I don't need an annual reminder like this. Well, perhaps after you made a spirit being and you're not living on this planet, that may be the case. But remember I said this is a, a yearly festival and early Christians kept it year by year. 
Verse 5, But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Now you would think that these people who saw uh, the plagues that affected Egypt, uh, the, the type of Passover when the, all the firstborn died, you would think people who saw that, they would remain faithful. But they did not. And God had to, uh, had to destroy them. And let's skip down to uh, verse 11. It says, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. Cain, Abel's brother, who decided he would do things differently than God's way. They've run greedily into the era of Balaam for profit. So some of the biblical uh, admonitions and commandments they decided to avoid because they thought it would be more profitable to do something else. For example, Jesus said to tithe, and they may think it were more profitable not to tithe. And Paris and rebellion of Korah. Korah rebelled against uh, God's physical leader at the time, which was Moses. And what is it, how does the Bible refer to this? Verse 12, Jude says, These are spots in your love feast. Well, they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water. Clouds without water are kind of useless. About by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit. A late autumn tree without fruit is useless. I mean, if it's a fruit tree, it's supposed to have fruit. Twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up by their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. So Jude is saying, there are people, they complain, they claim to be believers. Even the children of Israel who actually saw miracles, etc., you know, they crossed the Red Sea. You think that would be enough to persuade them, especially when they saw after they went across, the Egyptians got uh, destroyed. The excuse me, the Egyptian army got destroyed. Those who pursued them. You think that once you saw those physical things, it would work? No. Now those physical things should have helped them, and it did help some, but many ignored that, and many don't pay attention to God's message. Verse fourteen. Now Enoch the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with his tens... With, excuse me, let me read that again. Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute, execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So these apostates, these ones who have compromised, are going to be judged. But you might say, okay, fine, I'll keep the days of unleavened bread, physically at least, I'll pull the leaven out of my house, I'll, I'll eat a small piece of leaven every day, unleavened bread, excuse me, every day, after I've gotten all the leaven out of my house. So I'll go through the motions. But I don't like this. You know, this is a, what a weird holy day. We Nobody else in the world keeps this hardly. We shouldn't bother with this. Um, Look at the attitude that Jude is condemning in verse 16. These are grumblers. Do you grumble? Complainers. Do you complain? Walking according to their own lusts. Do you walk according to your own lusts? I bet we all do it sometime. And they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. Oh, you're spiritual. You're above doing these types of things. You don't need to remove the leaven from your house or sin from your life, because Jesus already forgave your sins. Truly, Jesus, uh, if you're a Christian, has forgiven your sins. But don't so, fall subject to intellectual vanity. I've seen ministers both inside, or claim to be inside, as well as outside the Church of God, who frequently appeal to intellectual vanity and flattery. And the goodness this is warning us against it. Verse 17, But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause division, not having the spirit. So during the days of leavened bread, what should we, what should we do? If we're uh, not building up bread with leaven, what are we supposed to build up? Well, let's go to verse 20. 
But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God. Keep yourselves in love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Verse 22, And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by their flesh. We're not supposed to want to have sin in our lives. We want to, we're supposed to love our brother, love our brethren, not by interfering in our lives where it's not appropriate, but helping when we can and where we can. And you say, but this is difficult in our own life to avoid sin. And I understand that. But during the days of living bread, you have a whole additional week. Hopefully, you did what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You examined yourself prior to the, uh, the Passover. And if you're a baptized member of the Church of God, you took Passover on the 14th at sunset. So during that time, hopefully you thought about your life, thought about sin, thought about rededicating yourselves to God. Now, you've got these seven days to work on sins. Now, some of you have been in the Church of God for weeks. Some of you have been in the Church of God for years. Some of you have been in the Church of God for many decades. Some sins are a bit easier to see. And some sins we get comfortable with, I'm afraid. And some sins we tried to overcome and we've not succeeded. But the Bible says we can do all things through Christ Jesus. Well, let's read what Jude wrote. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to, pre to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. So notice that God is able to keep us from stumbling, to keep us from sin, but God expects us to obey him. And one of the things he told us to do is to keep the days of unleavened bread. And you say, yes, but I, I believe, and that's sufficient. Is it? Let's go to the book of James, chapter 2, verse 19. Certainly we should believe. Believing is good. I'll get to James. I have to be careful when I'm flipping through pages because it's near the microphone. And I don't want to make it too, too difficult. That's one of the reasons why I have a tendency to write many of the scriptures out. However, I've noticed that when I have all the scriptures written out, I have a tendency to go too fast to them, to, to read them, and not necessarily always give people enough time to catch up to where I'm at. Let's go James chapter 2. James chapter 2. We're going to uh, go back to uh, verse uh, 12. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. So you should be acting like those who are supposed to speak according to the law and live according to the law. For judgment is, out, is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says, Depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you don't give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? So by the way, we just see here that there are physical things that Christians should be doing. Verse 17. Thus also, faith by itself does not, if it does not have works, is dead. And one of the internal works that you can do is to obey God fully during the days of leavened bread, which means not just physically eat a small amount of leaven, but also to uh, spiritually examine yourselves so that you do not keep sin in your life, so you live uh, without uh, uh, in endorsing sin, including sin. Again, you're trying to put the sin out of your lives. Verse 18, But some will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And it's, it's not always easy to keep God's laws, and certainly we're out of step with the world who keep the days of love and bread. 
Because while you're going to be avoiding leaven, the rest of the world is not going to be. The grocery stores will be open. They'll be, if, if you're in a Western world, at least, they'll be full of bread. The bakeries are open. They have all kinds of leaven and bread. But we're not supposed to be like the world. And we're supposed to show our faith by our works. Verse 19. You, you believe that there is one God. You do well. So it's good to believe in God. But notice the next part. Even the demons believe and they tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? We'll skip through here. It talks about Abraham was justified by works and with Isaac. And however, as verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called by a, called a friend of God. Verse 24, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Jesus condemned the Pharisees for basically having an outside faith, one that was just for people to see, but was not truly an inside faith. Uh, during the days of love and bread, we need to look on the inside. And again, when you eat a small piece of uh, unleavened bread, uh, you know what you're doing and others may not. I'd like to read something else from the book of Galatians. So you take your Bibles, go to Galatians chapter 5, and I'll start in verse 7. This is from the Apostle Paul. He said, Who hindered you from obeying the truth? And well, keeping the days of unleavened bread, by the way, is part of the truth. Verse 8. This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. Verse 9. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. The Apostle Paul was warning Christians that you're not supposed to compromise a little bit with the sins of this world. And while many of us uh, have stood out on faith, stepped out on faith, and we're not compromising with the world, we tend to fall into a routine. And we tend to think, well, everything's just fine. But the days of bread basically kind of pull you out of your normal routine. Yes, uh, other than on the uh, first and last day of unleavened bread, uh, you're allowed to work, unless it's a, a seven-day Sabbath. You're allowed to work. But just the fact that you can't have leaven should be in your mind somewhat. The fact that you're going to eat some leavened bread each day should be in your mind somewhat. And because of that, this hopefully will sharpen your spiritual senses so that this particular day of unleavened, days of unleavened bread, you may be complete and actually overcome certain sins or faults or problems that you've been trying to do for quite some time. Again, Christians can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens him. If you go to Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, uh, there's a passage I'd like to go over here. And again, for those of you who tend to think the days of the bread are necessary, think about this. Jesus warned in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And you'll say, wait a second. God wants me to do more important things just to, than to not eat leaven for a week. That's right. It is not the weightiest matter of the law to uh, put leaven out of your life and to eat unleavened bread. But just like Jesus was warning the Pharisees about tithing, etc., there are certain things that should be done without leaving the others undone. The days of leavened bread are a step. Maybe a small step, maybe a big step. But they are a step. They're a step to show that you're obeying God. They're a, step, they're a step to show that you're trying to live God's way. A step to show that you hope to have more mercy, judgment, and faith. A step to show that you have love for God and your neighbor and to keep His commandments. Continuing in Matthew 7, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Now Jesus is talking about those people who claim to be Christian. You can see some of them on television, by the way, who claim all these things. And Jesus will declare it to them. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What is lawlessness? It's not obeying God's law, uh, which would include the Ten Commandments. It would include uh, the Holy Days, include the Days of the Leavened Bread. 
Uh, in the book of Acts, chapter uh, 20, verse 6, we see that it, uh, Luke wrote, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of leavened bread. Now, I believe that they wrote this down to because they were still keeping the days of leavened bread. And also in Acts 12, verse 3, it talks about now something happened during the days of leavened bread. Now, I guess I should comment that when they sailed away from Philippi after the days of leavened bread, that was a Gentile town. It was in Macedonia, and it was ruled by the Romans. So at least a couple places in the New Testament, in the Gentile areas, we see that people kept the days of leavened bread. Uh, I mentioned before that Christians kept the days of leavened bread. Uh, I've looked through uh, church history. I found lots of different things about that. I'd like to read from uh, E.S. Gorham's History of the Church to, three, to 325 A.D., or to AD 325. He said, To the first Christians, the yearly, the yearly recurrence of Passover must have brought vivid memories of that which happened on the Passover of 29 AD, or AD 29. Well, he's got the year off. Passover is either 30 or 31st AD, but that's another matter. These associations soon gave a Christian meaning to the very word Pascha, or Passover. Christians understood that it had a new meaning. Christ our Pascha is sacrificed for us, wrote the St. Paul. And the sacrifice and resurrection, remembered at first, perhaps together with the night of Exodus, soon became the chief and only reason for observing the Feast of Leavened Bread. So it's interesting, he's saying that because of Jesus' sacrifice and resurrection, this was a reason for keeping the days of leavened bread. And they were kept by early Christians. I've read this repeatedly, but there was a letter from Polycrates to, or often I should say, uh, to the Bishop Victor around 195 AD where he wanted to keep different days uh, and or different time for Passover. And Victor said, Ourselves, the apostles, kept Passover the right diet today, the time when the Jews put out the leaven. And this is something that uh, they continue to keep. Now, Protestants might have heard of a scholar called Johann Karl Ludwig Geisler. So, Geisler, uh, actually, Geisler. Geisler is very well known, and he's a respected Protestant scholar. Here's what he said about the second century The most important in this festival was the Passover day, the 14th of Nisan. In it, they ate unleavened bread, probably like the Jews, eight days through. So even though there are only seven days of unleavened bread, the fact that you also eat some on Passover is like having unleavened bread for eight days. There is no trace of a yearly festival of the resurrection among them. And history, church history shows that uh, the days of unleavened bread uh, uh, were kept. However, over time, it became unlawful. The Greco-Romans actually uh, condemned it. And the uh, Council of Nicaea in the 4th century, Canon uh, 37 says, It's not lawful to receive portions sent from the feasts of Jews or heretics, nor to feast with them together. And Canon 38 says, It's not lawful to receive unleavened bread from the Jews, nor be partakers of their impiety. And basically, when you look at other scholars who looked at this as well, and said, okay, Christians were therefore keeping the days of unleavened bread. Otherwise, there would be no point centuries later uh, to condemn them. Now, in conclusion, the days of unleavened bread are first mentioned in the Old Testament, but it's in the New Testament we first, or we more fully learn about that uh, today, leaven pictures false religion and sin. The New Testament shows the connection between Jesus' Passover sacrifice and removal of sin from our lives. Now, according to the New Testament and records of historians, the original Christians observed Passover and the days of unleavened bread. Uh, Christians, like some observant Jews, purged their homes of leaven prior to sunset on the 15th of Nisan. And they avoid, Christians avoid leaven on these seven days. Now, if you didn't pull the leaven out of your house before you watched this, and it's, it's the uh, 15th or later, uh, after sunset, I would suggest that you go out and get rid of whatever leaven you can find. Uh, t today, as the cliche goes, is the first day of the rest of your life. But if you did get rid of the leaven out of your house as a Christian, and you're going to be keeping these days, realize that we're looking forward to the time of the return of Jesus Christ to establish his kingdom. And the Bible talks about the fact that Christians are going to rule with Christ. And Jesus said, those who are faithful in little will be faithful in much. How faithful will you be during these days of leavened bread? In addition to physically uh, avoiding leaven and eating unleavened bread, will you be faithful 
to try to purge sin out of your life, look more deeply and have this to be the most successful, spiritually successful days in love and bread that you've ever had. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.